welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Okay, so let's prepare our hearts. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. You can, if you have the ability, stand to your feet and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us this day. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence, into your house, openly and freely, God. Lift our hands and to sing to you, God, with a joyful shout, God. Grateful for what you've done this weekend already, God. We want to go further and farther with you, God. Come, Holy Spirit, be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the wisdom and the vision and the instruction, the correction, even the discipline that we need for each and every one of our individual lives. Come and speak to us, Holy Spirit. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear and hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our lives. Lord, how awesome you are and how wise you are that you can speak a now word to every person in this place, God, right where we're at. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. At no time do we see ourselves as any better than anybody else. We see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom, God. Pray that you would be amongst your churches, God, all over the world, God, as you would be amongst us this day. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. Today, have a seat and get your Bibles out. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, we go line upon line, precept upon precept. You say, what does that mean? That means that we just go verse by verse. Uh, Right now, we're in the book of Hebrews, and we have been in the seventh chapter of Hebrews for quite some time now. And coming to the end of the the chapter, if you want to find chapter 8, just back up a couple verses. We're going to be in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, verse number 27 and verse number 28. And pull some truths out. Hebrews chapter 7, we've been finding out about this thing called the priesthood, the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is now our high priest. He is our representative before God, and he's God's representative to us. That's what that really means. And we talked about how he was coming in the order of Melchizedek, no longer the old order of the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament. But no, now we see this man Melchizedek, who was a king priest, who, who had no beginning and no end. We couldn't see any genealogy. And that was a type of Jesus Christ who is eternal. And now he stands before the Father on our behalf. He is our high priest. He is our representative. He has the power of an endless life. And therefore, his priesthood doesn't change. He has an eternal priesthood. And so now here we come. And last time we were together, we talked about some attributes, how Jesus was fitting for us. Brilliant message. I would encourage you, if you haven't got a hold of that, get a hold of it online. It's absolutely free. Or you can get it from the CD counter. I believe they're like $6,000 over there. It's good. Just kidding. But pick that up and get a hold of that. And today we're going to continue talking about Jesus, our high priest. Verse number 27, verse number 28. It says in Hebrews, the 7th chapter, verse number 27, speaking of Jesus, who does not need daily is those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Now in the old covenant, the old law, the old system, There was a daily sacrifice that had to happen, one in the morning, one in the evening. Once a year, there was what was called the Day of Atonement. There was a day that they were going to cover the sins of the nation. That's what atonement meant in the Old Testament was covering. So they had to make a covering for sin. What they would do is that they would, the priest would go before the Lord and he would first make a sacrifice of a bull for himself and for his own sin. And then he would take the lamb and the goats and he would make atonement or a covering for the sin of the entire nation, for the people. And we see that Jesus here, he does not need daily as those high priests offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. Why? Because Jesus was sinless. Jesus never messed up, never sinned. He was the spotless, pure lamb of God. And that's why he qualified to be our high priest. But not only that, look at what else he does. He does something different than the high priest. You see, the high priest would bring sacrifices. They would bring animals. And that would atone or cover the sin of the people. But here Jesus, look at this. This he did once for all when he offered up himself. See, as high priest, Jesus comes and he doesn't offer up the blood of another. No, he comes with his own blood, the Bible says. Jesus was the only one who qualified to do that. Why? Because he had to be like for like. If he was going to take away our sin and exchange his life for our life, it had to be like for like. It had to be human. That's why he had to come and be born of a virgin. That's why he had to come and robe himself in flesh. He had to share in humanity and in the human experience. And therefore, he had to be a close relative. He would be one of our kin, if you will. And therefore, what he did was he offered up himself. He had this pure perfect, spotless, sinless life. And so he offered up himself on the cross. And that's why he came and he died, is because he qualified to do that on our behalf. Verse goes on, verse number 28, 
And it says, for the law points as high priests, men who have weaknesses. But the word of the oath, which came after the law, points the son who has been perfected forever. Now, talking about the word of the oath, remember, and he was the seventh chapter, talking about how God had sworn to Jesus, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, we know that Melchizedek showed up before the law in the book of Genesis. Then the law came. But now we find out that that word of the oath, when God swore to Jesus, you are a priest forever, according to this order. Now that comes in the book of Psalms, after the law. So now there's a change. There's something that happens when God speaks, and now he's setting something up new. He's doing something new. And therefore, God is speaking something to us, that now there is a change of systems. There's a change of law. There's a change coming. No longer is it the old high priest. It's no longer the old high priest with weaknesses. But now it's Jesus, our high priest, with the perfect, spotless, sinless life. Stands forever on our behalf, seated at the right hand of God now, because he has finished the work that needed to be done. Today, the title of today's message is Once for All. Once for All. See, there's a finality in that statement. Jesus offered up himself once and for all. See, he's not going back to the cross again. There's no other sacrifice going to be made for sin. Jesus Christ died once for all. You know, it blows my mind when I think about this because think about all the people that have ever lived on the planet. From the time God created man and woman there, Adam and Eve, till now, how many billions of people have come across the face of the planet? How many billions of people are on the earth right now? I mean, you think about that. They're doing censuses all over the world and talking about which is the largest nation and things like that. There is just a ton of people all over the place. And think about this. We don't know when Jesus is coming. How many more generations are going to come from those billions of people? Maybe trillions whatever else, gazillions or whatever you want to say, Brazilians. And and how many more are going to come ahead of us when Jesus comes? See, Jesus took care of the sins of all the people who have gone before us, all the billions of people that are currently on the planet, and all of the people who will come on the planet. Blows my mind. Why? Because how great is that sacrifice? How powerful is the blood of Jesus? How strong is our God that he can take care of the sin in our life once and for all to do away with it in his body and take on the wrath of God and the punishment for our sin? Wow. Just mind-blowing. So that should show us that we no longer need to operate according to that old way. No, we put those things away, and now we operate according to the new way. We see in Jesus once for all what he did. He is our example. He is our forerunner. He's the captain of our salvation. And therefore, we're following him. We're following his will, doing his way. And so today we're going to pull out a couple of things that I see in these two verses that Jesus did that now we, following him, can do as well. Are you guys ready for this today? Praise the Lord. Once for all, first thing for today, once for all, as he put away sin, we put away sin. Now, I'm not talking about that Jesus was a sinner and therefore had to stop it and put it away and therefore... No. Remember, Jesus lived the perfect, spotless, sinless life. He never sinned, never transgressed the commandment of God, never rebelled against God. Jesus walked in obedience to the Lord all his days. So what do I mean by put away sin? Let's take a look at it in the book of Romans. You mark your place in Hebrews and go with me to the book of Romans. We'll be back in Hebrews in a minute. But in the book of Romans, chapter number 6... Romans chapter number 6, we're going to take a look at verse number 10. Romans, the 6th chapter, verse number 10, says this. It says, for the death that he died, speaking of Jesus, he died to sin once for all. Everybody say once for all. all. See, he did it once. He's not going to the cross again. And the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives... He lives to God. See, Jesus didn't stay dead. He was raised again. So now the life that he lives, he lives to God. And Jesus did away with sin. See, he didn't have sin. No, he did away with sin when he died on the cross. And now the life that he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, if we give our hearts and lives to Jesus, now we have died to sin. We have put it away. No longer a part of our life. And now we live our life unto God. That's the example that Jesus left us. Jesus once dead, once bled, once died, once was buried, and now is glorified. And now he has done that once for all. See, and we get messed up with this sometimes. Why is that? Well, because we mess up. 
You say, Pastor, did you just say we get messed up because we mess up? Yeah, that's exactly what I said, okay? And here's why. Because after we're Christians, we think, you know, it's it's almost as if you say yes to Jesus, all of a sudden the air is sparkling clean, the birds are chirping, the sun rays are coming through the clouds, you can see forever, you know? It's just like you're walking on a cloud, you know? And then all of a sudden, what happens? You mess up. You sin. Do something that you used to do before Jesus came into your life. And you say, wait a second, time out, something's wrong here, what's going on? I don't know what's happening here. I thought I gave my life to Jesus. I thought I wasn't supposed to be this way anymore. I thought I was delivered from this. And so what do we do? We think we have to go get saved all over again, right? I better go to church. I better, you know, raise my hand and walk down and do my thing once again. Why? Because I messed up. God must be angry with me. He must not like me. And and, and therefore, I got to go and do it all over again. And yet, Jesus went to the cross and he did that once for all. It's a finality. And therefore, your sin has been removed from you as far as the east is from the west. You say, well, then why did I still mess up? Because you're still living in the flesh. And the sin nature in your flesh is at war with your spirit, which has been born again, made brand new. And therefore, you're going to mess up. In fact, in the Bible, in the book of 1 John, it says that if we say that we're without sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. But it also says that when we mess up, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, on our behalf, our high priest standing there. So what do you do? You take that sin, you confess it to him, you repent, and you turn from it. And the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you say, well, wait a second, wait a second. I I still feel bad about it. I still feel bad about my sin. Isn't that guilt and shame? Didn't Jesus take care of that? Yes. Jesus took the guilt and the shame that was associated with sin away from us. That has now been removed. There is no longer any guilt. Why? Because we've been justified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just as if we'd never sinned. And the shame associated with it, we are not ashamed any longer. No, now we can have boldness on the day of judgment. Because now Jesus has cleansed us of that sin. You say, then why do I feel bad? Well, you better feel bad. When you sin and when you mess up, you better feel bad. Why? So that you won't do it again. Why? Because you love God and you feel bad about offending him. And the Bible calls that not guilt and shame. The Bible calls that a godly sorrow. See, if you sin so much that you no longer have a godly sorrow, your conscience has been seared. And you're in a dangerous spot with the Lord. And you need to not practice that sin any longer. No, you need to, you, you need to repent. You say, well, what's that? Well, repentance is very simple. I was going this direction. I was doing something against the will of God. I, I figured it out that I was wrong. I changed my heart, my mind about it. And I turned to the opposite way, and I went away from that, and I went towards God. See, that's true repentance. And the Bible tells us that godly sorrow, so when you mess up, oh, I feel bad, I have a godly sorrow about it, now I'm going to repent. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, which leads to everlasting life. Let's take a look at it with the, with the Word, because uh, some of you guys are still processing this. Let's take a look at it in the Word. Hebrews, remember I said we're going to go back to Hebrews. Turn there with me to Hebrews, the 10th chapter this ter- time. Figured we wouldn't be in Hebrews 10 for a couple years so we could use it. We wouldn't remember it by the time we get there. It'll be brand new when we preach this sermon. Hebrews chapter 10. Starting in verse number 1, we're going to read through verse number 3. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1, says this, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things. What does that mean? It means that the law was the shadow, but Jesus is the substance. The shadow can't do anything for you. But Jesus, the substance, can do something for you. So the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, another very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. Now, compare that with the new covenant in Jesus. That means that Jesus, when you approach with Jesus, Jesus, his blood makes you perfect. Perfect. Now you are spotless and you are sinless in his sight. Verse number two, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? In other words, if those sacrifices took care of the issue, they wouldn't have had to have repeated them every year. I think about it this way. I'm a dad. I've got three young kids all under the age of eight. My little daughter, Chloe, was here in the rock stars singing with us. I got a, a son, Micah, six years old, and his son, Titus, he's three. Okay, great family. I love my, love my family so much. Now, I, I always like blessing my family, so birthdays and Christmas, that sort of thing, we get them little toys. Now, I think that the toy makers have made a pact with the battery companies. They've got something going on. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about, okay? Because it seems like every toy these days, you have to have not just one, but several different types of batteries just to operate that one toy. 
and it drives you crazy because you go, okay, I'm going to go get better. You buy double A's and you need triple A's. You buy a nine volt, you need double A's. And, and, and so you got to have like this plethora of batteries sitting there in your arsenal, right? Just to make this little toy do what it needs to do. And the kids will cry if it doesn't do it. No, daddy, can you go get the batteries in the store? <sighs> yes. So you know what I started doing? I started buying rechargeable batteries. Ah, there you go. See, now the toy breaks, I take those batteries out and I put them in another toy, right? But you know what? The toy will be doing its thing. And it stops working. Why? Because it's ran out of its charge. So I got to go back and recharge it. To me, the perfect battery would be the one that I go to the store and I purchase it once. I take that battery and I put it in that toy one time. I, I, I put it down. And you know, they never have like just an easy clip that you can open and close those things. You always have to have that little mini screwdriver to get in and out of it, right? And you almost have to be like a locksmith or a criminal to break into it, you know? And, and, so, and so, I'm not saying anything. I know we're in San Bernardino here, but anyway, so, so you, you, you mess with it. See, I would have to put it in one time and then it would work forever and ever, amen. Isn't that right? That would be the perfect battery to me. See, what the word is telling us is that Jesus went to the cross and his sacrifice is sufficient. And now he's not going again. It's just one time and it lasts forever and ever. Amen. That's what it's saying. For the worshipers once purified, going on in verse number two, for the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. See, why were they conscious of their sins? Verse number three. But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. See, every time, even if they were oblivious to their sin, the moment they had to break out another sacrifice, they would remember that they're a sinner. It could have been that they were going on with their lives. They messed up. But then here comes the Day of Atonement. Here comes the sacrifice once again. And they go, oh, yeah, I did, I, I did mess up. Oh, gosh, I said the wrong thing. I did the wrong thing. I, 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 oh, man, yeah, I need that. I need that. See, there was a sin consciousness and we were led by our sinful nature. The Bible says we were at enmity. We were at war with God and by nature we would do those things that were contrary to the will of God. But let's contrast once again. Go back to verse number two. See, that was the Old Testament. That was the shadow of the substance, which is Jesus. So now in Jesus, the substance, verse number two, take a look at it with me. It says, for them would they not have ceased to be offered. See, Jesus is offered one time, went to the cross once, died once, resurrected once, and now he is at the right hand of God forevermore. So it ceased to be offered. There's no more sacrifice. Jesus is the sacrifice. For the worshipers once purified have no more consciousness of sin. You say, what does that mean? Does that mean that we don't know that we're sinning? Does that mean that we ignore that we're sinning? Does that mean that we can sin and it doesn't matter? No, what that means is you're no longer led by your sin nature. You're no longer conscious of the way to sin and being led by that consciousness. No, no, you don't have the sin consciousness anymore. You've got the God conscious now that you're born again. Now, the Spirit of God is on the inside of you, leading you to do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And when you do mess up because of the fleshly, earthly nature that's at war with your spirit, now you have the God sorrow on you that leads to repentance, which leads to everlasting life. Anybody getting what I'm saying today? Anybody getting a hold of this? See, as Jesus put away sin, we put away sin. We're no longer sin conscious. No, now we're God conscious. We're in mind the things of God. Second thing for today, once for all, once for all. Number one was as he put away sin, we put away sin. Second thing, once for all, as he was perfected, we are perfected. You might be thinking, Pastor, yeah, it sounds like you're kind of repeating yourself here. Well, I get that if you're thinking of perfection as moral perfection. Last time we were together, Pastor Luke did a great job teaching us about how Jesus was blameless, how he's separate from sinners, that sort of a thing, and how morally and in the sense of being perfect, spotless, sinless, that was Jesus, and that's us now in our position of righteousness with Jesus Christ, right? But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a different biblical definition of perfect. There is a different biblical definition of perfect that speaks to being complete, fully furnished. All avenues are, are, are covered. Everything is taken care of. See, that's perfect. Uh, let me put it to you this way. If I were to say to you that I have the perfect plan, would you be thinking, well, Pastor Dan's plan is morally right? Go ahead. You can answer the question. It's all right. We have an interactive sermon today. You can talk to me. Would you think that if I said I have the perfect plan, you'd say that's the morally right plan? Would you say that? No, probably not, right? You kind of be thinking, no, I wouldn't be thinking that. Would you be thinking that was a sinless plan? 
Probably not, right? What would you be thinking? The perfect plan would be one that I covered all the bases, right? I, I had enough money to do everything that I needed to do. I had the right people in place to do what I needed to do. Perfect plan, I had the right time and the right season. Everything was planned out. Every base was covered. Every I is dotted. Every cre T is crossed, right? And every lowercase j is dot too, right? So, so see, that's the perfect plan. In the same way, as Jesus was perfected, as he was completed, as he finished the work of redemption, now all of a sudden he turns around to us and says, you're complete in me. You are fully furnished. I've got all the bases covered in your life. I'm going to take care of everything. I will perfect that which concerns you. I will complete that which concerns you. You say, hallelujah, pastor, that sounds great, but I'm having trouble. Uh, that, that sounds really good, pastor. I, I like the idea of that, but I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. I'm going through problems. So, so what, do, what do you mean by that? Oh, glad you asked the question. Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Very familiar verse. But let's take a look at some truths that I want to pull out today. Maybe we can see this in a new light. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. The apostle Paul is having a problem. He's in the midst of a trial. In fact, he's prayed about it and asked God three times to remove it. Anybody, I would think it's their prayers answered. It's the apostle Paul, who Jesus appeared to and knocked off his horse, right? This is a guy that was very special. The Lord had chosen him. The Lord has done great things with him. And now he's praying, God, remove this problem from me three times. And it doesn't happen. So the apostle Paul is bawling and squalling before the Lord and saying, God, what's going on here? And the Lord speaks to him. Look at what he speaks. The same thing he speaks to him. He speaks to us today here in the midst of our trials and our problems, our pressures. Look at what he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9. And he, capital A, speaking of Jesus, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. What does that mean? Grace is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. In other words, Paul, you can't get rid of the problem that's coming against you. But I can my grace is sufficient for you. It's more than enough. It will take care of the issue. Now look at the next part of the verse. For my strength is made what? Oh, come on. That was about seven or eight of you. How about the rest of you guys? My strength is made what? Perfect. Perfect. Where? In weakness. So the fact that you're feeling weak gives God the perfect opportunity to be strong on your behalf. In other words, right there in the midst of your problem, in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your insufficiency, in the midst of your lack, in the midst of your care and your concern, God says, my strength, right there, right in the middle of your problem, right in the middle of your trial, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it, because my grace is sufficient for you. Now the Apostle Paul gets a hold of that, and all of a sudden he has a revelation. All of a sudden, his tune changes. Look at what he says, the rest of the verse. He says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. You know what he just said? He said, I'm going to brag about how weak I am. He's going to brag about how he's not smart, he's not cool, he's not pretty, he's not nice, he's not, you know, listen, I don't have enough, I don't have the money, I don't have the resources, I don't have the time, I don't have the education. I will boast in that. Why? Why would he want to boast in that? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, when we get off of ourself and get onto himself, now all of a sudden, you have an opportunity to brag on God. You can say, I didn't have the money, but God came through. I didn't have the time, but God made the time. I, I, I didn't have the resources, but God brought it into my hand. I didn't have the friends, but God surrounded me with people. I didn't have the knowledge, but God dropped it into my heart, what I needed to do, and everything worked out okay. That's my God. That's his grace. That's his power in my life. See, we got to get off this, this, this pride and this arrogance of saying, oh, I'm, I'm good. I, I, you know, I bless God. I got the word. I'm doing. No, listen, I can't do it on my own. I need Jesus. I need the power of God. I don't have enough time and money and effort. I'm not smart enough to figure this out. I need God. That's called humility. That's called dependence on God. When we are weak, he then is strong. Are you listening today? So what have we learned so far? So far, we learned as he put away sin, we put his away sin. As he was perfected, we are perfected. I love what Andrew Murray said about this. He said, God has given you 
such a high priest that you might live an impossible life, a life above sense and reason, a supernatural life in the power of his son. My goodness, that's the kind of life God has called us to. Which brings us to number three. Number three, last one for today. As he was appointed, we are appointed. You say, now, Pastor, what does that mean? That means that God has chosen you, called you, has a plan for your life. You say, little old me? Oh, yeah, you. Talking to you. No, you got to be talking to my neighbor. You know, they look nice. They, they look cool. No, no, no. You. Wait, wait, no. Not just the church staff and the pastor. No, uh, uh, uh. You. God has called you. God has chosen you. God is looking at you. You. Why? Because as Jesus was appointed as our high priest, so also we are appointed. Jesus finished his work here on the earth, and where his work ends, ours begins. See, that's why Jesus said, it's needful that I go to the Father, because I will send the Spirit to you, and he will be a helper to you. And the works that I do, greater works shall you do than these. And we say, we can't do anything greater than Jesus. No, not greater in value or greater in quality. No, greater in number. Why? Because with just one Jesus walking around... He could do so much, right? Because he was one man here on the earth, and he did a lot. In fact, the Bible says if it, all the works that he did were recorded, then the earth probably couldn't even receive all the books that could be written. And so think about that. Multiplied times the millions, if not billions, of Christians on the planet. Now all of us with the Spirit of God on the inside of us, now you got a whole bunch of little Christ running around, little Jesus running around on the earth, loosed on the earth, wreaking havoc on hell, and now all of a sudden you have something multiplied all over the earth. Are you listening today? It's good. Turn with me to the book of Titus. There in 2 Corinthians, turn back towards the book of Hebrews, and you'll find 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then you'll find Titus. Titus chapter number two, talking about that God has appointed us. God has called us. God has chosen us. Titus chapter two, verse number 14. Titus chapter two, 14 says this. Speaking of Jesus, says he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself. See, that's he put away sin. He purified us. Now we put away that sin. He completed the work. We are perfected in him. So he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself, look at this, his own special people. I don't know if you knew this coming into church today, but you're special. Maybe you haven't heard that today. Maybe you haven't heard that your whole life. Maybe you heard you're a dummy. Maybe you've heard you're stupid. Maybe you've heard you're worthless and are never going to amount to anything. Maybe that's what they told you in the army or they told you in school or they told you at home. Maybe that's what you've been telling yourself all these years. But when you get into the presence of God, you find out you were redeemed, that you were purified, and now God looks at you and he says, you're special. He says, you're my child and I love you. Listen, God doesn't just love you. Think about this. He likes you. He wants to hang out with you. He wants to get on the inside of you. You say, but I'm dirty and, I, and I'm not the, the polished Christian yet. Uh, you know, God, why would God want to hang out with me? Because as you get in the presence of God, he is the refiner's fire and God changes you from the inside out. God makes you and conforms you to his image. God loves you. God likes you. God wants to be in and with you. God wants to get up in every part of your business, all of your life. The Bible says all of your days have been chosen. Are they not written in his book? See, God planned out all of Jesus' life, but you know God also planned out your life. God has divine appointments. God has plans and purposes and pursuits for you. God chose you. You are a chosen people. You are, some translations say, not special people, but peculiar people. You say, what does that mean, Pastor? It means you're weird. <laughs> Think about it this way. The world's looking at you saying, why are you giving up your morning to go to church? I mean, this is your day off. What are you doing here? You wait, you're going to give your money? Don't you need that? It's Christmas. Uh, why would you want to sit and read this book? I mean, you don't understand it, and you, you have trouble learning, and, and there's these and thous. If you got the old King James, I mean, what are you doing? They look at you, and they say, you're weird. And you say, mm-hmm, I am. Special. <laughs> Special to God. God loves me. God wants to be with me. The creator of the heavens and the earth has an appointment with you. He wants to sit down with you. He wants to talk with you. He wants to dine with you. He wants to lay. I, God, God wants to be in every part of your life. Oh, my goodness. 
Now, because of that relationship, look at the rest of the verse. His own special people, zealous for good works. What does that mean? That means you're excited. That means that you're passionate. You have a zeal to do the work of God in your life. You are now zealous for good works. See, the old system was you would do good works to get in right position with God. Now, because you have a right position with God, you have a passion. You have an excitement. God's called me. God's chosen me. And the Bible says that we are his workmanship and that God has already laid out good works in advance for us to do. So all you're doing in your days, you're saying, God, what do you want me to do today? God, who do you want me to bless today? God, who do you want me to tell today? God, what is it that we're doing together, God? Because I'm special. I'm called. I'm chosen by God. Hallelujah. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We're ambassadors of Christ. Now we're representatives of him here on the earth. And everyone, 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 everyone needs Jesus. San Bernardino needs Jesus. Highland needs Jesus. East Highland needs Jesus. Redlands needs Jesus. Ukaipa needs Jesus. Calamesa needs Jesus. Colton needs Jesus. Rialto needs Jesus. Bloomington needs Jesus. Reno Valley needs Jesus. Riverside needs Jesus. The high desert needs Jesus. California needs Jesus. This nation needs Jesus. The world needs Jesus. Jesus has sent you and said, go you therefore into all the world, preaching the gospel, making disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. He has called you. The world needs Jesus and the answer is you. You carry Jesus on the inside of you and you carry him to a lost and a dying world. You have been called and you have been chosen to go. God wants to equip you, saints, to go and make disciples who will make disciples who will Make disciples who will make disciples. See, that's what this is all about. It's a multiplying ministry that we go win souls and make disciples and win souls and make disciples and win souls and make disciples until Jesus comes. Turn me to the book of 1 Peter. Turn towards the back of your Bible. You hit the Revelation or maps. Turn around. Come back. 1 Peter chapter 2. Great verse. Great couple of verses we're going to take a look at. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse number 9. Verse number 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. But you are a chosen generation. Look at somebody and say, I'm chosen. chosen. Oh, come on. You can't. I'm chosen. <laughs> no. Get a little Pentecostalism in your voice right now. Tell somebody. And you got to add a syllable. That's what that means, really. It's, so you've got you to add a little ah at the end, okay? So say, I am chosen. All right? Go, go and tell your name. I'm chosen. <laughs> Spit a little bit when you say, I'm chosen. <laughs> Say, brother, say it. Don't spray it. <laughs> you, are <a> chosen, <laughs> you are a chosen generation. Listen to this. A royal priesthood. Oh, what does that mean? That means you thought you were the peasant. You thought you were outside the gate. You thought that you were just a peon and didn't have any position in the palace. But no, you are a royal priesthood. You've been appointed for ministry. You've been called a king's kid. And now you have a seat at the king's table, eating the king's portion. And God says, come on in and dine with me. Wow. A holy nation. You are separate and sanctified unto God. Now you are a part of the family of God. Look at this. His own special people. You're special. You're special. You're a peculiar person that some translations say you're weird. (laughs) Why? That you may proclaim the praises of him. See, you are called to go forth and to declare the will and the counsel of God to the nations, proclaiming forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. That's simply called a testimony. Everybody has a testimony. You say, I was raised in church. That's your testimony. You say, I was a drug addict and God saved me, cleaned me up and restored me and now I'm volunteering. That's your testimony. Uh, I've been saved for a long time, but God has brought me through a lot since I've been saved. That's your testimony. See, you are called to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at verse 10. Who once were not a people, but now are the people of God. You belong. You are a part of the family. You have an appointment. You have a calling. You have a purpose in life. God loves you, and God has called you and chosen you out. And God has plans for you who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 
Sometimes people look at pastors and they say, well, pastor, I can't do what you do. I'm not called to that. In fact, I don't really know that I'm called to anything. I'm just kind of a Christian. Well, if, if that's the way you're feeling today, I want you to hear the words of William Booth, the guy who started the Salvation Army. You know all those guys dressed ringing the bells? Salvation Army, they got the stores and things like that. They did a great and mighty work. And you can learn about them, but listen to what he says. Not called, did you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say. Put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Put your ear down to the burdened, agonized heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful wail for help. Go stand by the gates of hell and hear the damned entreat you to go to their father's house and bid their brothers and sisters and servants and masters not to come there. And then look Christ in the face whose mercy you have professed to obey. Tell him whether you will join heart and soul and body and circumstances in the march to publish his mercy to the world. The mission is great, church. The need is dire. People are dying and going to hell. The message is real. Jesus came and he died. He was crucified and now he's glorified at the right hand of God, representing God to man and man to God. He is our high priest. The power is available. The Holy Spirit's available to all of us. The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Will you go? Will you answer the call? Will you be the signpost? Will you be the wonder before the people? Will you proclaim his praises? Will you go and love the unlovable, touch the unclean, mend the broken, preach the word, minister to the saints, wash their feet? Will you go lay hands on the sick? Will you cast out the devils? Will you go and be God's hands and feet here on the earth? Will you choose once and for all to follow Jesus? Today, what have we learned? We learned once for all, once for all, that as he put away sin, we put away sin. Secondly, what did we learn? We learned that as he was perfected, so we are perfected. Finally, what did we learn? We learned that as he was appointed, so we are appointed. Come on, let's give God a great big praise in this place today. Hallelujah. God good. Hey, I want to say thank you to everybody. You guys stayed, and I appreciate you guys. You guys are so good. First service was a bit naughty. They, they still left. They said, mm-mm, we're out, you know, so you guys were good. And I just appreciate you guys staying. I appreciate you guys listening to the Word of God. I really do believe you got something from the Word today. Let's talk about your life before you leave. God wants to speak to you. I want you to just tune out all distractions right now. Just focus in on what God has to say to you. Turn off your cell phone. Don't worry about the person next to you or somebody that you see walking around. No one to get up. No one leave. Let's focus in on what God has to say. I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. Just answer this in your heart right now. Let's find out about where you're at with God before you leave this place. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Just answer that right, right here in your heart. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Sometimes people think they're going to heaven because they don't believe in hell. I don't believe in hell, therefore I'm going to heaven. You know, the Bible talks about hell. It's a very real place. Jesus spoke of it. Old and New Testament, we find hell. So just by denying its existence doesn't make it any less real. You're going to have to face the reality of it. You're not going to go to heaven just by denying hell. Sometimes people say, well, all, all roads lead to heaven. That's why I think I'm going to get to heaven because all roads lead to heaven. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible say all roads lead to heaven? It doesn't work like that. You're not going to get to heaven your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. You've got to get there God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. God's heaven. You've got to get there God's way. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I think I'm going to heaven because I've been good. You know, I used to be bad, clean up my act, now I'm good. Give money to charities, help out, been conscious of what I purchased. That way, you know, other people get blessed when I buy shoes or water or whatever it is. Well, that's great, and I'm glad you do those things. Could you just show that to me in the Bible where your goodness gets you into heaven, where you do good deeds, you're nice to people, or you give money or that sort of a thing? It doesn't work like that. In fact, nowhere in the Bible say you can be good enough to get to heaven because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sometimes people think, well, I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians. They took me to religious classes, hung a cross from St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized your Christian. As you grew older, you got involved and helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions. People thought of you as a leader. You know, you, you volunteered at that church, got a membership card and everything. And while that's great, and I'm glad that that was your life. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible say you're raised in church and your parents tell you you're a Christian? Take you to religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized a Christian as a child, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible say you get involved in church and help out and do your thing there in church. Get a membership card that God's looking for your membership card before you can enter the gates of heaven. It's not about your goodness, once again. 
Sometimes people say, well, I understand that, but you know, I, I, I know who God is. I, I know about the Bible, and I, I celebrate Easter and Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to the Old and New Testament. And while that's great, once again, I'm glad you can do this. You can just show that to me in the Bible, could you, where that gets you into heaven? Because it doesn't work. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you have head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. You know who God is, or celebrate a holiday, or can quote scripture. In fact, the Bible says... The demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible records the devil himself quoting scriptures out of his mouth, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Rather, this is about your heart. Have you given God all of your heart, and have you given God all of your life? Because if not, I love you enough to tell you the truth, you're not going to make it. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals. They made it out to be something that it's not. But what does being born again really mean? Because we're not going to get to heaven any other way, so we have to get there God's way. And God's way is that you must be born again. So what does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible means what I just said, that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. That's simple. That's simple. Have you given them all of your heart and all of your life? Because if not, I love you enough to tell you the truth, you're not going to make it. Well, let's not leave you there. Okay? In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity just like this. One, two, three, count to three. Pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands pop together just like that, bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence. Tell us your hand go up. I'll count it. Put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You might be. Let's push past that today, okay? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for eternity in hell? Come on. The devil's going to try and talk you out of it. Your flesh is going to try and, you know, shame you out of it. Oh, no, no. People are going to think it. People are going to say, listen, we're all rooting for you. We all love you. We're all excited for you to do this. We've all done it, okay? So no one's judging, no one's criticizing. We're, we're excited. Even if you are embarrassed, better than being in hell. Come on. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life in the safe, friendly church service today? Who should raise their hand in a moment? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure about your salvation, come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, giving him all of your heart and life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? Say, what's lukewarm? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down. A little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, Jesus said, I didn't say it, Jesus said, you're lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. So listen, only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, if that's you, any of those four categories I just mentioned, get ready to get your hands up all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television, in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online around the world. You can raise your hand. God is watching you right where you're at. If you're online, you can click the blue button on your browser that says respond to God or go to our homepage. It says no God. Okay? Someone will lead you in a prayer. Let me count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. Get ready to get your hands up. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? Three wise people already on this side. Where are you at? Three wise people already. Point up top four. Gotcha. Thank you. Five up there. Thank you. God bless you. Six over here. Thank you. God bless you. Six wise people already on this side. Ushers, help me because it's kind of hard for me to see with the lighting the way it is right now. So if you see somebody, just point over to them. About five or six wise people. I know there's more than that. Up there. Thank you. God bless you. Got you about six or seven wise people. Who else today? Who else today? Can't do it for someone next to you. They got to do it themselves. They got to want this. Okay? Thank you, number eight. God bless you. We had number nine and ten. Thank you, number nine. Got gotcha. you. Number ten out there in the foyer. God bless you. Got gotcha you over there. If you're sitting there wondering if you should, out there in the foyer, great. Thank you. God bless you. Number eleven. If you're, if you're sitting there wondering if you should, thank you, number twelve. I'm, you know what? I'm just going to shut up. Hey, who else? Because God is speaking to you right now. If that's a hand, I'll, hey, praise the Lord, 13, thank you. Who else today? Who else today? God's speaking to you right now, where you're at. You're saying, yeah, it's me. Who else today? All you got to do is listen. You know God's prompting you. Yeah. 
who else? Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? We'll close it up in a second. Don't miss this opportunity. Anybody else? I'm going to wrap it up. If that's you, go for it. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise bow. Somewhere in the neighborhood, 12 to 15 wise people. All those of you that raised your hand, or if you should have raised your hand, but you did, not too late. Here's what I want you to do. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, we're going to change destinies today. Can't do that until we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand, you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. No one leave during this time. Very hard to get people to come forward when you're going backward. Okay? So let's get them to come forward first, then we'll let you go right afterwards. Let's all stand and welcome them. You come right now. Nudge your neighbor. Say, I'll go with you, friend. Come on. Come on. Come on. You raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. You come. Come on. Let's give him a hand. You can come too. the family rooms. Come on down. Bring your children. They'll remember this. Come on, come on, come on. If that's you, just make your way to the front right now. They're still coming. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. You can come too. Come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, thank God you guys have come. So, so awesome. You can put a smile on your face. The good thing is not a bad thing. Hold on one second. I need to talk to someone right now. If you raised your hand, but you didn't make your way forward. Listen, we love you. We're not trying to trick you. We're not playing games. There's a real thing here. And I know it's tough to come in front of a lot of people. Maybe that's not your personality, that sort of a thing. And so I understand. But the Bible says that Jesus wasn't ashamed of us. Therefore, we shouldn't be ashamed of him to confess him as our Savior and Lord. So I'd encourage you to make a bold move. And while I'm talking, give some instructions. Just come on down. No one clap. Just let them come privately. They'll come. All right, you can come give your heart to Jesus. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by giving God all of your heart and all of your life. Okay, so if that's you, you need to make your way to the front. Just come on down. And listen, if you're saying, I'm not going to do that, okay, we do have prayer teams that are up here right after church that would love to pray with you privately and lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Okay, and we'll just love you through the process, okay? And so God is good, and we, we love you, and we come. If you're not going to come right now, you said, I'm just not going to do that. That's cool. Right? Right after church, come and pray with someone. They'll lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. Hey, you guys up front. All right. Thank you for letting me do that. Okay? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. Right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel. Really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. Okay? You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder if they're weird. Listen, this is about as weird as you're going to get today. Okay? He's cool. First thing he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. Okay? You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Third thing he's going to do, he's going to give you a friend. He said, what? A friend? Yeah, we have friends here in the church that we like to call spiritual personal trainers. Friend in church that will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how it works. It's easy. It's free. You need to do it. Okay? So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Drew all right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, 
as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.